watch TV. Open up that magic box and look at what's inside. Needless to say that with the appearance of the internet and the subsequent changes in our media environment, the nature of televisual programming and its relation to an audience necessarily had to change in order to adapt to new modes of consumption. Imagine, if you will, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's newspaper. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it may seem. In the 1970s, Raymond Williams coined the concept of flow in television studies. He wrote that it is evident that what is now called an evening's viewing is in some ways planned by providers and then by viewers as a whole, that it is in any event planned in discernible sequences which in this sense override particular program units. Whenever there is competition between television channels, this becomes a matter of conscious concern, to get viewers in at the beginning of a flow. Individual programs are glued together with ads so as to create a kind of fluid viewing experience, leading to a shift from the concept of sequence as programming to the concept of flow. This sequence is designed to optimize television's built-in automatism. The viewer is set on a linear path from one program to the next, and will only disrupt the sequence if they feel their experience could be improved by switching to a different channel or turning the television off altogether. And so, it is in the network's best interest to design the sequence in such a way as to minimize potential disruption, keep the audience hooked. This is a profoundly different conception of programming compared to previous forms of entertainment. Williams writes that in all communication systems before broadcasting, the essential items were discrete. A book or a pamphlet was taken and read as a specific item. A meeting occurred at a particular date and place. A play was performed in a particular theatre at a set hour. The difference in broadcasting is not only that these events, or events resembling them, are available inside the home by the operation of a switch. It is that the real program that is offered is a sequence, or set of alternative sequences of these and other similar events, which are then available in a single dimension and in a single operation. What is it then that has been decisively altered? A broadcasting program on sound or television is still formally a series of timed units. What is published as information about the broadcasting services is still of this kind. If you're a selective television viewer, then you should be reading TV Guide magazine. Nothing else tells you more about what's on, more about what to look for, more about everything you need to know to enjoy television more and understand it better. Get TV Guide. We can look up the time of a particular show or program, we can turn on for that item, we can select and respond to it discreetly. Yet for all the familiarity of this model, the normal experience of broadcasting, when we really consider it, is different. And indeed, this is recognized in the ways we speak of watching television, listening to the radio, picking up on the general rather than the specific experience. The internet, on the other hand, appears antithetical to this programming strategy, because the internet is not linear in this way. It is not automated. An individual is, apparently, free to do whatever they want, consume whatever media they want, whenever they want to, at their own leisure. In this sense, the internet is comparatively more static and fragmented, at least in its most basic form. These new platforms lack the urgency of automated televised entertainment. You can't really miss anything if you don't tune in at the right time. Everything's ready at hand. So how do you maintain an audience's attention on a platform like this? In their article entitled The Moral Economy of Web 2.0, Audience Research and Convergence Culture, Joshua Green and Henry Jenkins state that media companies are being forced to reassess the nature of consumer engagement and the value of audience participation in response to a shifting media environment characterized by digitization and the flow of media across multiple platforms, the further fragmentation and diversification of the media market, and the increased power and capacity of consumers to shape the flow and reception of media content. Audience participation is the answer to the question. The internet brings with it the possibility of accelerated communication and discussion surrounding media products. In short, the internet allows for the emergence of widespread fandom culture. You can walk into a bar and decide that you want to have a conversation about uh, football today, because you were just at a football game, and there might be two or three people who want to talk about football in the bar, but it'd be very difficult to find them. In this world, 
there's a table with a big sign on it saying football. And there's about 150 or 1,000 jocks from all around the world who want to talk about football. So you sit down, you say, what do you think of the Raiders? <coughs> and uh, 500 people answer you. As the web has made fan culture more accessible to a larger public, and as digital tools have made it easier to perform such activities, a growing proportion of the population now engages in what might once have been described as fanish modes of consumption. And while streaming services like Netflix may not propose a linear sequence of programming for viewers, the cultural discourse around certain shows may motivate you to prioritize them over others, thus, in a sense, organizing your viewing habits and creating a new kind of flow. Far beyond being a simple marketing strategy, with a company like Disney, this discourse becomes an integral dimension of the works themselves. In Convergence Culture, where old and new media collide, Henry Jenkins says consumers are encouraged to seek out new information and make connections among dispersed media content. And thus, a new kind of automatism emerges. Fandoms themselves become the glue that holds the programs together, creating a sequence that guides the consumer from one product to the next. Uh, if the audience can become involved in the actual process of making the ad, then it's happy. It's like the old quiz shows. They were great TV because it gave the audience a role, something to do. They were horrified when they discovered they'd really been left out all the time because the shows are rigged. Now, the, this was a horrible uh, misunderstanding of TV on the part of the uh, programmers. But in the same way, most advertisers do not understand TV media. Do you know that uh, most people read ads about things they already own? They don't read things to buy them, but to feel reassured that they have already bought the right thing. In other words, they get huge information satisfaction from ads far more than they do from the product itself. This, the, uh, the sat what we're advertising is heading is quite simply into a world where the ad will become a substitute for the product, and all the satisfactions will be derived informationally from the ad, and the product will be a merely a number in some file somewhere. Jenkins calls this kind of transmedia storytelling that Disney has become so efficient at the art of world making. It's the process of designing a fictional universe that will sustain franchise development, one that is sufficiently detailed to enable many different stories to emerge, but coherent enough so that each story feels like it fits with the others. This joins what Maurizio Lazzarato writes in Les Révolutions du Capitalisme. He says that contemporary enterprise creates not the object, the merchandise, but the world where the object exists. It creates not the subject, worker or consumer, but the world where the subject exists. He goes on to say that the modern capitalistic company does not exist outside of the producer and consumer that express it. The world of the company, its objectivity, its reality, become enmeshed with the relationships between the company, the workers and the consumers. Seated here, we're in a very delightful situation, on the very verge of a very large changeover in our entertainment industry. Uh, it's uh, like many large changes, hidden till the last moment, but the uh, American public is uh, about to enter the entertainment industry as participant, that is, the audience is about to become workforce. But the missing element of this rudimentary conception of transmedia storytelling and mixed media franchises is reflexivity. Reflexivity is the secret ingredient that drives fandom engagement. It is that symbiotic, participatory relationship between product and consumer. Reflexivity is what enables the subject to navigate the constructed world and that which constantly reiterates the consumer's relationship to that world. Just as screenplays for network TV shows are written around ad breaks so as to manage the flow of the viewer's experience and avoid losing the audience, the individual entries in Disney's transmedia sagas are built around references to other media products so as to maximize viewer participation and avoid losing the audience once they finish watching a particular film or series. Every individual entry opens up to a multiplicity of alternative products, creating an endless hall of mirrors. This reflexivity operates in a similar way to trailers one might see on television for upcoming shows. 
Williams writes that amid competition between TV channels, the immediate reason for the increasing frequency of programming trailers is to sustain that evening's flow. The process is specifically referred to as moving along, to sustain what is thought of as a kind of brand loyalty to the channel being watched. From the perspective of the flow, the content of the individual programs is irrelevant. They are only useful insofar as they maintain that flow, that audience engagement. Same goes for individual Disney shows or movies from the perspective of this dynamic world making. All that matters is that an individual entry contributes to the overarching continuity, the grand narrative. WandaVision was a great illustration of this strategy. The show is not only built around reflexive references to the history of sitcoms, but its initial episodes exist almost entirely as a vehicle for easter eggs and clues for the audience to decode. The fourth episode sees characters on the outside looking in on Wanda's fabricated sitcom world and themselves attempting to identify clues that may help them understand the situation. They take on the same role as the audience on a metatextual level, implicitly imbuing the hyperattentive viewer's task of interpretation with great value. Here the mise en abyme is not simply reflecting the story of the work in which it is embedded, as was the case with Loki's play in Thor Ragnarok, rather it is highlighting the fandom's reflexive engagement with the transmedia product. The show even features a nod to a different iteration of a Marvel character from Fox's X-Men franchise, thus extending Disney's web of references beyond the bounds of what were its own media properties at the time. Just as the latest Spider-Man movie has done to previous incarnations of the Spider-Man character, Disney is effectively retroactively subsuming different properties into its own world, such that we may now watch Days of Future Past or the old Spider-Man movies, knowing that these actors portraying these characters will reappear years later in Disney movies or Disney shows. Disney can, in this sense, rewrite history. In this light, it's clear to see that the multiverse, as a narrative device, exists primarily to accommodate corporate expansion. And so, perhaps it's not so surprising that, in WandaVision, we are made to sympathise with a character who has taken thousands of people hostage and rewritten their lives so as to realign them with her nostalgia-infused illusion, her own kind of world-making. 